thank you, Pastor Brad, for that uh, kind introduction. And just know that those those feelings are are mutual. Pastor Brad's right. I mean, we we came here um, 17 years ago. Our, my uh, daughter Bella was, or actually Ruth was was pregnant with our uh, daughter Bella. In fact, the picture is up there. She Bella's the one all the way to the left. Um, that's me next to her. In case you were wondering. <clears throat> This is really uncomfortable because you notice I have the same outfit. <laughs> uh, I noticed that this morning they put it up and I was like, I, I literally had the thought, maybe I should take my shirt off. Uh, <clears throat> but I wouldn't do that to you. My wife doesn't even want to see that. So anyways, that's really embarrassing. But anyways, so, so my wife, uh, Ruth, uh, she was pregnant with, um, with Bella when we first came here. So 17 years ago, we, we came here. And uh, as I was saying in the first service, um, this place is, is ju- it just feels like home. And we just have so many incredible memories here. And I said this in the first service, I'll, I'll say it again. That I, and I know you know this already, but you are so blessed to have somebody like Pastor Brad and Debbie, their family here. It is, um, <clears throat> it is rare. I've been in ministry now for over 20 years. And it's very rare to have somebody who, who is as committed and loyal to the same people, the same place. And so I just telling you what you already know. And so he has been a dear friend, and it was such a blessing to serve here for eight, nine years. Uh, we left here to go uh, to Bryan, Ohio, uh, and I served as a senior pastor there at New Hope Community Church. And while the picture's still up there, I'll introduce our kids really quickly. They couldn't be here today, but um, that, that's Noah on the right, and then that's my wife, Ruth, and then our son, Tyler. He's 18. He, he just turned 19. Um, he has a girlfriend. I'm really um, <clears throat> not sure about how I feel about that yet. I'm not ready for that. Um, <laughs> And then Sophia, who's our youngest, uh, is, is 12. And of course, that's me in the same outfit and then my daughter, Bella. Um, real quickly, before we take the picture down, when I left to go to New Hope, uh, I had been there for about uh, maybe, maybe a month. And, you know, when they introduced me, you know, we all came up and, you know, Ruth and the kids were up there. And it was probably a month later. I was down, downtown. Brian's a real small town. And I, I was at the local coffee shop. And I ran into a woman that uh, attended the church and still does today. And she says, you know, Pastor Pat, she says, we've met your five kids. <clears throat> we've met your five kids, but when are we going to meet your wife? <laughs> so it took me a minute. I took me a minute to process that. And I thought, wait a minute, what, what is she saying? She's saying that Ruth looks so young, she thought she was my oldest daughter. And so um, <clears throat> I really, really took offense to that and still <laughs> working through that with my therapist. But I, I, uh, I, I love being a dad. I love being a pastor. And it is such an honor uh, to be back here with you today. I have so many great memories here. My son, uh, Tyler, was baptized here. My dad, who preached his last sermon um, in, in uh, 2010, preached his last sermon here while we were still at the YMCA. And I could just go on and on and on. Petey would kiss me every Sunday, get red lipstick on my cheek, and I'd have to explain <laughs> it to Ruth. And, uh, and I know many of you have come up and, and seen us uh, at our church plant there. But anyways, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Brad but a dear friend, partner in ministry, and, and uh, to the elders for allowing me to come share God's word with you. I don't take that lightly. And so um, enough about me. I'm here to preach God's word. And so um, I, it's so encouraging. I, I've dialed in on a couple services lately, and it's so encouraging to see and hear what God is doing. And for those of you that remember me when I was here, if you don't judge me on who I was 17 years ago, I won't judge you. And so, uh, that's, uh, and so God has just done a great work in my own heart, and it's such an honor to stand before you and to open God's Word and to share in this series. We're going to be continuing on in this series, uh, Praying the Psalms. And uh, I know uh, last week you, you had this great celebration. Thirteen people were baptized. What an incredible thing. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about the Psalms of Lament. We're going to talk weeping and crying and, and taking our pain to God. So if last week was a major chord, today's a minor chord. Um, but I only say that um, just joking. We're, we're going to dive into what it means to lament, what it means to take our hurt to God, uh, what it means to be a, a person, but also a people that, that are growing in, in taking our laments. And we're going to look at one example in Psalm 62, but we're going to end in praise because that's what the Psalms always do. Um, you know this already because you've been in this series. The very last Psalm is what? Psalm 150. And it's a psalm of what? It's a psalm of praise. The psalms are full of these honest cries of the soul, lamenting. A third of the psalms, in fact, are, are songs of lament. And yet the very last psalm is, is a psalm of praise. 
And I've always been struck by that, that no matter how you come to God, you come in your discouragement, you come in your crying, you come in your your weeping, you come in your questioning. But when you encounter God's presence, when you encounter his grace, you can't help but leave him in praise. And the Psalms are just an example of that. And so we'll get back uh, to that theme. But let me pray for us, and then we're going to dive in and talk about what laments are all about. And so, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the worship that we've already enjoyed, the songs that we sing. We want all of our life to be a response to your love. And you have loved us so perfectly, so completely, so sufficiently in your, in your son, Jesus. And we look to the cross today. We're reminded of what you accomplished for us, Jesus, that it was your obedience to the Father that, that had you penned to the cross, but it was also your love for us that had you penned to the cross. And you lived a life that we couldn't live. You died the death that we deserve, and the Father raised you victorious over sin, Satan, and death. And we stand before you today clean and forgiven. We are a people of hope. We're a people of, of future. No matter what we're walking through, God, we ask that you would remind us of that today. And so we ask for your spirit to come. We, we need the Holy Spirit to understand spiritual things. And so we just ask that you would guide our thinking, my preaching today, that your church, Jesus, would be built up and encouraged. And so strengthen me now as my heart is to strengthen your church. And so we just pray that in your powerful and beautiful and good name. Amen. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to go ahead and pull that out and open to Psalm 62. I should be there in about 47 minutes, but I wanted to give you enough time to turn there. Um, So we're going to be looking at one example of a lament psalm. The word lament just means to express sorrow, to express grief. And so, as I said, a third of the psalms are these songs of lament, these cries of the heart. And we're going to look at just one example in a little bit, Psalm 62. And so my goal today is to just look briefly at Psalm 62, and I want to highlight three things that the lament psalms invite us to do. And so very practically today, we're going to look at Psalm 62, and then three things that that really the psalms of lament ask us to do or invite us to do. And so we'll get get there towards the end of the message. But you and I both know, I don't don't have to tell you this this morning, that, that you don't have to live very long to begin to experience not only the beauty of the world, but also the brokenness of the world. I mean, I was in the room with my wife when all four of our kids came into the world, and I think three out of four of our kids came out screaming and crying and kicking like, I want to go back in. Um, and so you don't have to live very long to, to begin to, to experience the beauty of the world and what it means to exist, what a gift it is to even exist, and yet also the brokenness of the world. We come out of our mother's wombs crying and kicking and screaming like, wait a minute, this is going to be a different experience. And as we look back on our life at different times, different seasons, we realize that some of our weeping, some of our lamenting is very silly, and yet some of it's very serious. I remember as a kid, you know, I grew up in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and one of my favorite traditions around Christmas time was to go uh, look at the Christmas lights. We would load up, me and my two older sisters and my parents, and we would load up in my, my parents' uh, Chrysler car. We would drive around Fort Wayne, and we had to look at the lights. We would go through the neighborhoods where, where uh, they had lots of money and lots of lights, and it was just, you know, incredible. We'd go downtown, and if anybody's from Fort Wayne, they, they still do this, but, but the Santa Claus is on the, on the side of the skyscraper. We'd go down and do that. And our tradition was that on Christmas Eve, we were allowed to open one present. And I remember I was probably seven or eight years old, and that Christmas came around, and I looked at the tree, and I decided I was going to pick the one that looked most like the Star Wars figurine that I really wanted that year. I don't even like Star Wars anymore. But I remember seeing that and thinking, that's got to be the one. And so I, I started to unpack it and unravel it, and I, I learned very quickly that this was, it was a Star Wars figurine, but it was not the one that I really wanted. And so I did what every seven or eight-year-old kid that, you know, doesn't get his way, you know, I, I just began to cry. And it wasn't just like a little tear down my cheek. I mean, he was like weeping and lamenting and crying. And I didn't just cry for a few seconds. I mean, I cried for the entire hour that we drove around Fort Wayne looking at the lights. Now, my parents are both in heaven today, and, and so I, they are richly rewarded because of that experience. Like, <laughs> I mean, as a parent, I look back and go, man, I, I, I'm lucky to be alive. Uh, my parents were so gracious. And I look back on that and think that was... That was such a silly lament, such a small lament. It was such a a seemingly insignificant thing to cry about, and yet as we've lived and walked through life and done ministry, there's been other times, other seasons, other circumstances where the lamenting has become more serious. The pain has become more significant, the loss greater. You know, in 2018, on January 2017, I'll share this story really quickly, but before I do, I'm not an expert in lamenting. 
So hear me on this, but I'm not, an, I'm not an expert on suffering. Some of you sitting here today have suffered far worse than I have. Some of you are in the midst of, of pain that's far more significant. And so I just want you to know that, that as I share this story, like I'm not an expert on suffering. I'm just a fellow companion with you, just limping along by God's grace, just doing my best to keep my eyes on Jesus. And my, my present hurts just as much sometimes as yours does, but, but, but I'm not an expert. You know, on January 17th, 2018, um, I was waiting uh, a doctor's call from, I guess, a nurse and was, was waiting to hear some results. I had previously in December um, gotten news that, that an MRI showed a, a, a lesion, a tumor, uh, deep in my hip socket. It was sort of right where that, that hip and the pelvic bone meet. And so um, earlier in the summer, I did what every 40-year-old guy should not do. We were at a church picnic. I jumped into the pool, so excited to play pool basketball. And as I got in there, I, I got a little bit aggressive. I thought I was still 20, and I ran after the ball, and I, ran, I dove after a ball and collided heads with one of the guys that was part of our core group. Now, I got a big old, you know, strong head. It's about the only big old thing strong in my head. You know, it just, like, I didn't, it was more painful for him, but it, it, it just cut my ear enough that I got an ear infection. And I didn't think much about it until it went week after week. I found myself in the emergency room several times, and I, I discovered that I had a, an ear infection that just wouldn't heal. It was the first clue that something was really wrong with my body. Um, I injured my hip not once but twice in November. The pain became so significant, I couldn't stand while I was preaching, and I finally went in for an x-ray. They ordered an MRI, and that's when they found the lesion deep in my hip socket. So on January 17th, 2018, I got that call from um, the nurse uh, telling me that, that I had a, a rare type of blood cancer that usually uh, women over the age of 65, they're, they're the ones that are most likely to get this kind of um, blood cancer. And if you're wondering, I'm neither one of those. Um, <laughs> and so I, I found myself in a world, I, I heard that word cancer. And those of you in the room that have experienced that or you've had a loved one experience it, you know how that world turns your world upside down. That word, that word, a word that I had never heard of. I found the only piece of scrap paper I could find in my, in my minivan. Ruth was driving. We just picked up Tyler and one of his friends from the homeschool co-op that they were a part of. And I began to write a name, a word that I couldn't pronounce, let alone spell. And the nurse, sensing my confusion, finally stopped me and said, it's a kind of blood cancer. And I'm so sorry. I began to lament, I began to weep, not, not all at once there, but as I began to put the pieces together and understand what it was that we were up against and what the Lord was asking us to walk through, I began to lament, I began to mourn the, the loss of my health and potentially the loss of my, my future. I would go through five months of frontline treatment of weekly injections and oral chemotherapy pills, and I would do two stem cell transplants at the University of Michigan, one in July, one in October, and we would find out later in October of 2018 that we had put the cancer in remission. Oh, what, a, what a victory. Um, we enjoyed about two, two and a half years of remission. Uh, this past summer, a year ago, I was out digging in the, in the landscaping, and, and I, I was digging a hole, and I was just drenched. In fact, I came around the front of the house, and my neighbor looked at me, and he said, are you having a water gun fight? <laughs> like, no, I'm just over 40, and I'm just trying to dig a hole. <laughs> but at, I didn't know it at the time, but I actually fractured a rib um, at, that, at that time. It was in, in June of last year, so almost, I guess, almost a year ago. I uh, went through four, five, six months of just trying to let that heal, and then finally went in and got an x-ray. Long story short, we found out two days after Christmas this year that my cancer is back. Now, that's where we're at. Now, I share that, not, to, not to, so you feel sorry for me, but I tell you that because what I'm about to preach, I believe. And I also share that with you so you can bump, you know, grandma off the prayer list or your Uncle Bill. <laughs> Put me up the top. I'm probably nicer than they are anyways. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. Um, so I started treatment. I'm here today. I haven't preached in eight weeks, so if this feels a little bit like I'm learning to drive a stick shift, I apologize. Uh, I began preaching at our church in two weeks, but I came back here to work out the kinks. All right? But I started treatment again. I, I'm about nine weeks. I guess tomorrow will be 10 weeks of a 16-week treatment, and we're in the process of killing cancer. So it's a, good, it's a good thing. So we're encouraged. Um, you, can, you can celebrate that and you continue praying for us. My body feels a little beat up, but my heart is full. The Lord has been so good to us. God has been so good. 
God has been so good. And if he doesn't give me another day, doesn't give me another month, doesn't give me another year, God has given me far more than what I deserve. And I believe that. I, I really do believe that. So God has been so, so good. And so lamenting has been a part of our life over the last two and a half, three years. Crying out to God, going to God. And so the Psalms, I love the Psalms. Love the Psalms. People come to me as a pastor. They're going through a difficult time. And they say, what do I do? And I say, just bury yourself in the Psalms. Get alone with God. Begin to pray. I mean, you know, one of the things that I, that I really wrestled with when I was first diagnosed is it was difficult for me to read my Bible. I know I'm not supposed to admit that. That's why I'm admitting it here, not up in my church. Um, <laughs> and so we'll edit that out of the, out of the uh, anyways. <clears throat> so, but I, I found it very difficult to, to read the Bible, and, and even praying was difficult because I couldn't find the words. I didn't, it just felt like sort of like a mist to me. It was difficult for me to even find the language, and it's one of the gifts that, that God gives to the church is that he gives these prayers, not just spontaneous prayers that we pray and need to pray, but he also gives us written prayers. He gives us this long tradition of, of written prayers recorded for us in Scripture, in the book of Psalms, and certainly outside of the Scriptures, and, and we need the Psalms. We need these, th- this language that, that really sometimes just articulates what it is that, that we're feeling and thinking and what we're longing for. And so I love the book of Psalms. You don't have to have cancer this morning to be lamenting. You know that. Some of you are here today, and you're mourning, you're weeping, you're lamenting, not because of of health issues, but but maybe you're here today, and and you felt the the, the sting of betrayal from a spouse. You gave yourself away to, to a spouse and you've walked together, you've done life together for years and decades, and, and now you feel the sting of that betrayal. Maybe you're here today and you are a wife, but man, you want to be a mom. And so the pain you feel, the lamenting, the cry of your soul is, is that you just would love to be a mom. Your friends around you, they're getting pregnant and it seems so easy for them. And, and yet you, you and your husband, you just, for whatever reason, it's just not the right, the right time and you're lamenting, you're mourning because you want so badly to be a mom. Maybe you're here today and you're a, a parent or a grandparent and you feel the weight, the aching, the throbbing in your own heart because a son or a daughter has walked away from the faith. You've done everything that you thought was right to do. You raised them in the right way and you raised them in church and yet that son or daughter has walked away from the faith and you're aching inside because you are a prodigal parent of a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. Right? I mean, all of us, we, we hurt and we ache and we lament in different ways and this is why I love the Psalms of Lament. It's such an important part of what it means to, to grow as a disciple. And God uses our lamenting and he uses our weeping and he uses our crying to continue changing us and transforming us and drawing us into a deeper relationship with him. He does. He never wastes hurt. He, he doesn't do that. And so uh, we're going to talk about that theme this morning. You know, you guys have already uh, talked. This is why I said it was going to be 47 minutes until we got to Psalm 62. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I love, and I'm just, for, for review's sake, I know Pastor Bat already hit some of these things, but the book of Psalms is 150 psalms, or 150 psalms. They're, they're cries of the heart. They're this ancient hymnal, this songbook. I mean, they're these, these beautiful prayers that God's people would pray, and they would pray them individually, but they would also pray them communally. I know Pastor Brad said he doesn't like poetry. We just pray for Debbie. Um, <laughs> But there are these beautiful cries of the heart, these songs. And I saw something so cool. I was watching um, one of the services. I don't think it was last week. It was the week before. And Pastor Chris came up and just did such a good job of pastoring you and just sharing that word. And it was right in this area in here. I don't know who it was. My vision stinks. I don't know who it was. Could have been a guy. Could have been a girl. It's hard to tell. But I know that I saw as he began to pastor you and just give that word, I saw somebody who, um, who must have known what that other person was going through. And they just sort of walked over and they just put their arm around them. Ah, that was beautiful. Whoever that is, that was beautiful. And I thought that's exactly what the Psalms do in community. You see, the Psalms function not only as individual cries, but they also function communally. They also function as a, as a group. In, in other words, there are times where we gather together as a church and we want to cultivate that, that environment here where if you're crying and weeping, that's welcomed. When you find it hard to praise God, it's okay to cry. It's okay to come to the altar, to come to the steps and just to pour out your soul. And so we do that individually at different times and in different ways. But, but the Psalms function in such a way that in community, it means that those who are strong, they come alongside. Because we suffer together, but we also rejoice together. 
And you did that last week or two weeks ago. And that's what the Psalms are meant to do. You see that example all throughout the scriptures of God's people lamenting, not just individually, but corporately, together as a group. And so the Psalms are these 150 Psalms, these ancient, uh, these songs, these praises. And one of the things I was just sharing in first service that I thought is so cool is that, you know, the book of Psalms is the Old Testament book that Jesus quotes the most. Do you know that out of all the Old Testament books, Jesus quotes the Psalms the most? And not only that, but Jesus prayed these prayers. Like, isn't that a cool thought? You know, I grew up singing a lot of hymns. You know, my mom and I, I love our modern worship and contemporary worship. Um, but I also love hymns. And, and I, one of the reasons I love hymns is because when you sing them, you are singing them knowing that there are generations of men and women who came before you. And they sang them in their miscarriages. They sang them in their sickness. They sang them in their sorrow and their questions and their discouragement. I grew up, my mom and I, we'd, after dinner, we'd go sit at the piano, and I took just enough piano to be dangerous, and so I would sort of clunk out a couple tunes, and she would begin playing, and she would play Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. You know that song? Some of you know that song. Her favorite hymn was Great is Thy Faithfulness. We would sing that song, or she would play it, and, and I remember, you know, years later, being married and having kids and singing those songs and thinking, wow, how powerful it is that, that I'm, you know, 39 and living in Sylvania, Ohio, and I'm singing this song, and my mom sang it in Fort Wayne, Indiana, when she was a pastor's wife and whatever year. And not only that, but my grandfather, who got saved listening to the radio, lived down in Kentucky. My family comes from the coal mining towns of, of Kentucky, and he was listening to the radio out of Grand Rapids one day, and God just blew him away with his grace. And he heard the gospel as if he heard it for the first time. He heard God's extravagant love for him. It was like he was hearing it for the first time. And he was cut to the heart and he confessed his sin and he turned to Jesus. My mom was a teenager at the time and she came into the house and she found him as a grown man weeping because of God's goodness. Weeping because of God's love for him. He knew his past, but now he knew his future because of what Christ accomplished for him on the cross. So my mom sang that song. My grandfather sang that song. You know, just it's a powerful thought. So when you read the Psalms at home, when you're in your room or you're on campus or you're in your small group, remember you're reading these Psalms that the ancients who came before us read and cried through and worshiped. I just love that thought. And so the Psalms are just incredibly, incredibly powerful places that we need to take our hurt. You know, I said this already, but the Psalms make up a third of all or the, the lament psalms make up a third of all the psalms. The Bible's full of crying and lamenting and mourning. We're, we're sort of sometimes struck by that because our, our modern Christian culture doesn't always encourage that. Depending on what tradition you come from, the expectation is for you to come in and have it all together, to be positive and encouraging. And yet the Bible says, no, there's permission. I give you permission to come. Uh, to hurt is to be human. Uh, an honest spirituality is a healthy spirituality. And so bring your hurt to me, God says. Bring it as an individual. Bring it as a family. A third of the Psalms are these lament songs. The entire book of Lamentations is just that. It's a lament. It's interesting that God's name is never mentioned, I don't think, in the book of Lamentations. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but, but God seems far. He seems distant, and God, God's people are crying out to him. And so the entire book, and so we're, we're welcomed to bring our crying and our hurt and our honesty. God is big enough for that. And he wants it. The scriptures say that God is close to the brokenhearted. So he loves you this morning if you're lamenting. If God seems distant from you, if you're discouraged, if you're questioning, it's not a lack of faith. It means that you're human. And God says, I'm big enough, and so bring it to me. I love you. I'll love you in the midst of your hurt and your suffering and your lamenting. Now, one other quick thing, and then I promise I'll move on, and the three points are rather short, so be encouraged by that. You're like, I wasn't lamenting until I came to church. (laughs) Or why is that? Oh, yeah. So one other quick thing about the Psalms. The Psalms were set to music. And you know that. I know you know that already. You know, we, we sing this morning. Gabe, the team just did a phenomenal job. And it's one thing to just read those songs, isn't it? But you know, if Gabe got up and just said, we're going to read these, these songs, and we did that, it, it would be interesting what the response would be. Uh, but we sing those songs. We set them to music. And the Psalms that we read, and even the Lament Psalms, They were set to music, and you're wondering, what's the point? Who cares? The point is that the Psalms were meant to stir your emotions, that there's something so significant about music. I think it was Socrates who said that when the soul hears music, it lets its guard down. You ever wonder how insignificant your voice, you know, like you could live without having to sing, and yet God has wired us 
was thinking about this the other day. I was driving home. I had an extra cup of coffee and started thinking deep thoughts and thought, wow, you know what? Like, I could live without my voice, like singing. Like, I could make it. But yet God wired us. He created us in such a way that something so insignificant as singing would be a part of what we do and do naturally. Like, we were made for praise. And so the Psalms, they're set to music because they're meant to be more than just information. We, we read them and study them. I'm going to preach them today. I am doing that. But the Psalms originally, they, they were meant to be set to music. They were set to music because they were meant to be stirring our affections and our emotions. They move us. And that's why we're going to end this service by, by praising. Maybe one last song at the end. There's about three. I hope you can stick around. And we're going we're gonna to worship, we're going to praise, all right? And so, my goodness, that clock is really moving fast. So, Psalm 62. All right, let me move on. I'm going I'm to hit these. All right, let, let's look at Psalm 62. Here's what the psalmist says. Again, I'm going to read this passage for us, and we're going to highlight three things that the psalmist asks us to do or invites us to do. Verse 1 says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress, and I will never be shaken. See, the psalmist is preaching to his own soul. How long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place, and they take delight in lies. With their mouths, they, they bless me, but when I turn my back and walk away um, in their hearts, they, they curse. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Notice how he switches that word. In verse 1, he says, my salvation comes from him, but the only difference in this verse is he says, my hope comes from him. Even when God doesn't deliver, even when the cancer comes back, even if he's not my salvation, my hope will not be shaken. I might lose the battle here, but ultimately, my ultimate hope will not be lost. He is my helper. He is my salvation. He says, he is also my hope. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Again, the only difference between this verse and verse 1 is instead of saying, I will never be shaken, he says, I will not be shaken. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what that means, but at least in part, of what I, part of what I take from that is that even when I'm shaken, I will not be shaken. I will never be shaken, he says in verse 1, but then when I get shaken, I will not be shaken. <laughs> see, what he, see what he's doing? I will not be shaken. Shaken. It goes on, yes, my soul finds rest in God. My, my hope comes from him. I will not be shaken. Verse 7, my salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Now notice verse 8, he begins to now address the assembly. He goes from preaching to his own heart, reassuring his own heart, but now he turns and he begins to preach to his brothers and sisters. He begins to preach to the community. And he says in verse 8, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath. The highborn are but a lie. If weighed on a balance, they are nothing together. They are only a breath. Do not trust in exhortation or uh, put, vain in, uh, put vain hope in, in uh, stolen goods, uh, though your riches increase. Do not set your heart on them. And then notice how he ends, verses 11 and 12. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to God. See what he's doing? Every... Every um, lament psalm has the same structure. There's a complaint, there's a petition, and then there's a resolution. And so verse 11, verse 12 is, is the resolution. He says, one thing I've heard, two things I've spoken, the power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. There's hesed, there, there's loyal love. There's a kind of a love that will never separate me from you. And so even though I'm, I'm like this tottering fence, this leaning wall, God, you are a powerful God. And, and your love will not leave me in my weeping. So then he ends in verse 12, making this, this reminder of your reward. You reward everyone according to what they have done. Now, quickly, I know that, that I don't have a lot of time this morning. Actually, we don't have another service after this, do we? So we're, we're good. <laughs> Let me highlight three things, all right? So I want to I highlight three things for us this morning that I think we can pull away from Psalm 62 in particular, right? So if you're taking notes this morning, as always, this is an old joke. I was saying it when I was here, and I'll keep saying it till the day I die. You get closer seats in heaven for filling in your sermon notes, all right? <laughs> Um, and so fill those in. So here, here's, you'll see uh, some notes here uh, that maybe will be helpful to you. But I want to highlight three things that the laments invite us to do. Number one, the laments remind us that there is always a choice to be made. Okay? 
that there's always a choice to be made in our weeping and in our hurting, in our crying, in our questioning, and you're thinking, what does that exactly mean? My point is this, that if you are hurting this morning, no matter where the hurt is coming from, no matter how you're lamenting, no matter what it is that you're crying out to God for, you have a choice. That suffering always comes with a choice. And if you are hurting today, you are potentially in a more dangerous place than you realize. Why? Because you and I have the opportunity in every hurt, in every disappointment, in every question to take our hurt to the wrong place, to the wrong person, to the person that's not your husband, to the person who's not your wife, to the drug that's going to wear off tomorrow morning, to the Netflix series that's going to run out. I mean, God is reminding us that the laments are are meant to to remind us that there is a danger in suffering. There's a danger in lamenting. There's a danger in mourning because we're oftentimes tempted to take our hurt to the wrong place, to the wrong people. And here's what the psalmist says again in verse 2. He says, trust uh, He says, truly my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, and so I will never be shaken. He uses this word in Hebrew, the, the, the word rest means to be still or to be quieted. You think of a father who comes into his daughter's room or his son's room and she's scared senseless and he just begins to soothe her, begins to whisper in her ear, in his ear. The psalmist is saying that, that when we choose to run to God, he puts our, our aching, scared, questioning, hurting heart to rest, stills it. That's going to be okay. This hurts like hell, but but I know you're with me. You've got me. You're with me. You're for me in the midst of my weeping. And so the psalmist reminds us, be careful if you're hurting. Be careful if you're mourning. Be careful if you're lamenting. Be careful you take your hurt to God himself. He is your salvation. He is your helper. He is your deliverer. He is the one who puts your your heart at rest. And when we're hurting, we're tempted to go in so many different directions. Patchway concluded. So the psalmist is reminding us that in our lamenting, there is a choice to be made. And he says, I will run to you, God. You are my salvation, my help, that you're the one who puts my heart at rest. Here's the second thing that we see. The the lament psalms not only remind us that there's a choice to be made, where are you taking your pain right now? But he also reminds us that there is an invitation. Uh, Look again at verse 8. The psalmist says this. He says, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts. I love that. You know the word that that he uses for pouring out your heart is the same word that's used for shedding blood. Just think for a moment, you're out working in the yard. You know, I don't don't do this anymore because I'm weak and old. Um, But, you know, if you're out working in the yard using a tool, you just accidentally cut yourself and you just begin to gush blood. That's what the psalmist is saying. Like, Like when you run to God, when you make the choice to go to him with your hurt and You begin to pray these prayers or write out your own or you just begin to cry out to God. You're gushing out your hurt to God. God, I'm hurt by the relationship that I was in. I don't understand why that friend that I had been in a relationship with with for so long has hurt me. I don't want to be in a relationship with me anymore. I tried to reconcile that, but God, you, you know what that's like. Jesus, you know what it's like to be misunderstood. He's gushing out his heart to God. He's inviting us to gush our heart out to God. The only person on the planet that knows exactly what you're going through is Jesus. Nobody's been abandoned like Jesus has. Nobody's been forsaken like Jesus has. Nobody's been misunderstood like Jesus. Nobody's been forgotten like Jesus. Nobody's had friends like Jesus who in in his hour of need, he needed them to pray for them. He needed to stay awake from them, but instead he comes back and they're asleep. And so the point is that, that that God in Christ, he, he knows our hurt. He knows our pain. And sometimes we spend so much time and energy trying to get other people to understand what we're going through. And even the best wife, the best husband, the best friend, the best pastor will not be able to love you in your lamenting like Jesus can. There's an old saying amongst our Catholic brothers and sisters where they oftentimes will say, hide your wounds in the wounds of Christ. Maybe if you come from a Catholic background, you're familiar. It's oftentimes attributed to St. Ignatius. But this idea of coming to the wounds of Jesus and and offering our wounds and telling him what it is that that we're hurting over. And Jesus meets us in that place. And what we find is what our heart is really looking for. We find the love of God. We find that we're loved in such a way that we, we had no idea before. That's the invitation. It's the choice to bring our hurt to God, but it's also this invitation to be loved by him. 
See, the greater the honesty, the greater the intimacy with Jesus. And so Jesus is inviting some of you today to just name the hurt, name the suffering, name the wound, name the lamenting, tell him about it. He knows exactly what it's like. And when you're honest with him, the intimacy grows with him. And sometimes there's just no words to be spoken, and that is there. You know, really quickly, because I've got all afternoon, I'll just tell you one other quick story, um, and then I'll move on. But I remember when Ruth and I were, were, were newly married, I remember sitting at a restaurant, been married for maybe a year or two, and we looked over and we saw an older couple who were maybe in their, their 80s, and they were sitting alone at a table, and they weren't saying anything. You ever seen that? Ever experienced that? I remember being young, married, I remember being incredibly ignorant and incredibly arrogant. And I looked at my wife and I said, we'll never become that. You know, when we've been married for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, we won't be like that. We'll have lots to talk about. Because our love's different. And those of you that have been married a long, long time know that that's not a picture of dried up love. That's a picture that sometimes just the presence of another is enough. Don't miss that. You just, just sit on it. Just take that with you this morning. And so sometimes as we're lamenting and we're crying and we're going to God, God doesn't give a word. But you know, what is, you know what's enough? His presence. Sometimes the words aren't there. Sometimes we can't hear God's voice. But to be in the presence of God, to say yes to that invitation to be loved by him is enough. And it's like being held by a father. That's the invitation, to be loved by God. And so we see in the, in the Psalms of Lament this choice of running to God. He is our rock and he is our refuge. And that invitation is to come and to be known by him and to be loved by him, to be in his presence. And you know what the writer of, of, of Romans says? Paul says in Romans chapter 5, I love this, verse 5. He says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been what? Has been poured out into our hearts. How? Through the Holy Spirit. So think about that for a moment. The psalmist is saying that when you're hurting, when you're lamenting, run to God and pour out your heart. And guess what God does in response? He pours out his heart through the power of the Spirit. That's, that's what it means when we become a Christian. We, we, by faith, believe in what Jesus has accomplished for us. And God's Spirit comes to dwell in us. God himself lives in us. And one of the primary tasks, one of the primary jobs of the Holy Spirit is to always be testifying. You're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. I love you. You belong to me. I mean, that's what the Spirit of God is always doing and wanting to do. And yet oftentimes the voice of the enemy is, is easier to hear than the voice of our Father through, through the Spirit. And so the, the writer of, of Romans, Paul, says that when we pour our hearts out, we need to remember that God is pouring. He's just continuing to pour his love out in our hearts through his Spirit. I love what Pastor Brad said. We're, we're commanded to keep being filled by the Holy Spirit. God wants to give us more and more of his love. I'll close with this here. But the last thing that we see in this psalm is that not only do laments offer us a choice and an invitation, but they also offer us a resolution. All right? Now notice again here in verses 11 and 12 that what the psalmist is doing is the psalmist is declaring in the midst of his circumstances what is true about God. Looks around at his circumstances, looks around at his job and his wife and his family, or his church, or whatever it is, and he says, yeah, this, this looks like a mess. It looks like I'm losing. It looks like things are falling apart, and what the psalmist does is he makes this resolution, but this is what I know to be true. This is what is true about God, and he appeals primarily to both God's power and God's love. You ever get so discouraged and you're lamenting? I was reading recently the, the story of the woman who was bleeding for 12 years, right? And yet she keeps coming. I... I my cancer came back a few months ago, and, and I'm tempted at times to stop praying for healing. Well, it didn't work the first time. Think about that woman. For 12 years, she kept praying and kept believing. It would be 12 years that she suffered from that bleeding until she would come and she would touch the hem or the, 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 the corner of Jesus' robe, and Jesus would heal her. It's easy in your lamenting and your mourning to give up on God's love and God's power. And so I love that the psalmist reminds us that in our mourning and our lamenting, we, we need to remember and even declare who God is. Your son or your daughter that has walked away from the faith, you've been praying for so many years. It doesn't seem like God is hearing the prayer. God, God is powerful. It's speaking the truth into your truth. It's not minimizing your pain. It's not making light of what you're walking through. 
but it's speaking something truer into your truth. Uh, It's saying, yeah, my life really stinks right now. It's really hard right now. But here's who I know God to be. It's not just an act of faith, it's an act of defiance. I'll tell this story as we close as an illustration of Gabe's going to come and lead us with one last song. I'm going to encourage you to to respond in some way this morning. But I was here in uh, in 2010, and I believe that that I left in 2011, shortly after my dad passed away. My dad passed away in a, in a car accident. Those of you that were here uh, while I was here, you remember that story. He died suddenly. I obviously didn't have a chance to, to be with him or to see him. It would be two years later that my mom would pass away. I would be with her in the hospital room. I held her hand. I saw her go from this life into the life to come. What a gift. And I remember um, shortly after uh, my, my dad passing away, just... just beginning to to process that and to try to heal from that. But I remember exactly where I was at when I heard the news of his death. I was over at the Sylvania Library. I was doing some work there, and uh, my sister had texted me and let me know that there was a a bad accident, that my dad had been in a bad accident, and that it was likely he wasn't going to make it. I remember packing up all of my stuff and beginning to get things ready, and I was going to drive home to our house that was in Sylvania there on Erie Street. And I got just a couple blocks down Main Street. I was right in front of J&G's Pizza. By the way, my birthday's in February. If you want to get me something really good, <laughs> please deliver to Ann Arbor. But I remember getting right in front of J&G's Pizza. I can tell you exactly where I was at. When my sister called and I heard those words, he's gone. You know what I mean. Those of you that have lost a loved one, uh, parent, grandparent, you, you know exactly what I mean. It's sort of like 9-11. We can all name where we were at. I could tell you exactly where I was at on that block in front of J&G's when my sister called and said, he's gone. I began what would be a long season of lamenting and crying and learning to to do everything that I've I've told you, trying to do the best I can, limping along, trusting God's grace. And and I remember it was about a year later, I was back in town and I I decided that what I was going to do is I was going to drive by that very spot that I heard my sister say he's gone and I was going to speak another word. And so that's what I did. I drove down Main Street in my you know, old minivan that was falling apart, and I rolled the windows down, and, and, I, and I said as loud as I could without causing the undue attention of the authorities, uh, I said at the very spot where my sister said he's gone, I said, he's alive. He's alive. I spoke the truth into my truth. I made a resolution that in my lamenting, in my crying, in my questioning, that there is a greater truth that defines my current reality. And my current reality is not my final reality. And so as we close this morning, I would just ask you the question, what is it that God is asking you to make a resolution for? You know, the Psalms are interesting because these Psalms of lament, if we could look at all of them, you'll notice that, that there are different resolutions. Sometimes the psalmist comes to the end of his crying and his weeping, and his resolution is, I will trust you, God. I mean, there's nothing in my life that, that gives me evidence that, that you're in control or even good. And yet the psalmist will say, but I trust you. Sometimes the psalmist will come to the end of a lament psalm and it's not trust, but it's like, I will, I will faithfully love you. If you loved me in my suffering, Jesus, I will love you in mine. And sometimes the, the psalmist comes to the, the end of one of those lament songs and it's not trust, it's not love, but it's this, this faithfulness. Oh, God, this is who you are. You are powerful, and you are loving, and you are good. It's an act of defiance in the midst of your pain. And so I would just challenge you this morning. I know not everybody is in a place of lament. And if you're not, this is an opportunity for you to be the body. As we close, you're in a good place. You're in a strong place. But maybe there's somebody here that you came with. It's a close friend. It's somebody in your small group. And so as we close, I would just ask that that maybe you would come, and you just put your arm around that person. I want to just offer this invitation for us this morning for you just to maybe say out loud as we close, this is my resolution. God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to keep loving you. I'm going to keep obeying you. I don't know what that is for you. But would you make a resolution this morning in the midst of your lament, in the midst of your crying? Maybe that's you just speaking that. Maybe that's you coming and kneeling here on the steps. Maybe that's as simple as you standing where you're at, as Pastor Brad was saying. You're just, this is an act of surrender. God, I belong to you. You purchased me at the cross. I don't belong to myself. God, my life is yours. So pour it out, God. Pour it out. God, I belong to you. You created me. 
My very existence is out of your love. You sustain me in this moment, and I'm going to return to you one day. And so maybe just standing and saying, God, I surrender to you, whatever that is this morning. But what is that resolution that God is asking you to make this morning? I'm going to pray for us. Gabe's going to lead us here for just a moment and just ask that however the Spirit leads you this morning to respond in a way that that is appropriate to the way that God is, is leading you and speaking to you today. Father, we love you. Thank you that you're a good Father. Thank you that you love us and that you are so patient with us and so gentle with us. You've given us your son, Jesus, to make us sons and daughters. Uh, The promise that that blessed are those who mourn because we're going to be comforted. Thank you for, for the comfort that comes with being loved by you and comfort that comes with the presence of your spirit and what Jesus has accomplished for us. God, I pray that you would speak to us today for those that are struggling, that are hurting, that are lamenting, that that this would be a step towards you and not away from you. We confess that in our hurt and our questioning and our crying, it's easy to run from you instead of run towards you. God, by your grace, don't let us do that today. Don't let us be foolish and run from the source of healing, the source of hope, the the source of love. And so would you speak to us today as a church family, as a community? For those that are strong, would you strengthen them so that they could strengthen those around them? For those that are hurting, God, draw them to you today. Strengthen and encourage them, Lord. We love you and we thank you that Jesus and his lamenting and his crying still surrendered himself to you, Father. And you raised him in glory and power and victory. And his future is our future. We believe that today. We claim that today. We pray in Jesus' good and powerful name. And all of God's people said,